Well, welcome to today's presentation, um, part of the Purdue Extension a &R seminar series. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Fred Whitford. Uh, Fred, as many of you know, is the director of the Purdue Pesticide Programs. Um, today, Fred, you're going to be speaking about uh, Extension's rich heritage and working with Hoosier farm families uh, uh, at the beginning stages where the rubber meet the, met the road in Extension. And uh, one of the things I like about Fred is he's a true believer in Extension and the power of Extension and education to change people's lives and make a difference in their work, in their business, uh, and in their families. Uh, Fred is one of our most sought after speakers in Extension throughout the state and you've done presentations in the Midwest and other parts of the nation as well. And one of the things that uh, people may not be aware of is that Fred is a, a prolific writer. He's an author of several books and publications. And uh, today, Fred, your topic is going to be Enriching the Hoosier Farm Family, a photo history of Indiana Early Extension Educators, which is, or agents, which is also the topic of your book. That's correct. That's so with correct. that, Fred, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank oh, you very, very much. Oh, very good. Very good. So those of you in the audience, uh, uh, any of you, which, uh, if you have questions, just speak up and we'll take them here. Um, it is going to be taped, obviously, and then uh, passed around, so we'll answer questions. I thought we would start off by saying, ma'am, why, why is it important, or is it important, why are you here to learn about history? All of these men and women are dead. All of their programs are gone. Uh, why in 2017 should we even care. I think we can learn from history. Ah, everything repeats itself. And if you know something about history, uh, that is in fact a, a really important, though we typically don't view history that way. So I thought what I would do is to try to under, have you understand kind of what our history was like. And before there was an extension service, here are three of the books that uh, led up to the one that you're about to to, to hear about. The one on the right is called The Grand Old Man. Mr. Latta came from Ligonier, Indiana. He'd gotten his master's degree from uh, Michigan State and basically replaced the first ag teacher who had, was not here very long. And so Mr. Latta showed up, a very religious man uh, who in fact um, wanted to help rural people. And so if you've ever heard of Farmers Institutes, he started them. And they would go for decades and decades. He would create the winter short course that would go, I think, Walt, till the 70s, maybe 80s. I haven't gotten that far. Early 80s. early 80s. He would be the creator of that. He was the only professor in the School of Ag. You didn't need many. You only had about a dozen students. So if you go back into the early days, Bruce, the question was, why send your kids to Purdue? I already know how to plow. And I remember reading that in one of the letters, and I said, okay, I can see why. And so what he did was, Mr. Latta did, he would hire the best farmers available to teach the topics. And all of us in here would agree the best teacher is oftentimes the person doing the work as part of their livelihood. And so Mr. Latta would hire this lady in the middle. Her name was Virginia Meredith. Uh, if you're familiar with Purdue, Meredith Hall is named after her. And uh, Mrs. Meredith is one of the 200 most influential people in Indiana's 200-year history, uh, a book that came out. A fascinating woman who in the 1880s and, and later on, uh, he would hire her and she would, she would work six days a week for 25 bucks a week. And that was Monday through Saturday. And she traveled the state at first teaching men how to raise livestock. And if you think about a woman in the 1880s, 19, early 1900s, telling men about raising livestock uh, would have been quite the chore, right? But one of the things that farmers appreciate is people who know how to make money. And so in spite of it being that time of uh, a period in time, uh, she, did, she was very successful. She would also become one of the first uh, trustees, the first woman trustee at Purdue. And then on, the far, on your left is Skinner. 
And uh, Dean Skinner was the first official dean of the university. And it's his story about how he was able to create what we have today on campus. Most of our buildings, the old brick buildings that you see, all came out of that, of that era. Now, it wasn't until 1912 that Extension would hire its first agent. And understand, we were already doing teaching, Don. We were, um, and so we were teaching the students. We were already doing research, but we couldn't get information out. Our research reports, nobody wanted to read. They wanted the same as today. Get to the bottom line and tell me what it is that you found. I don't need tables. I don't need nothing. Just tell me what you found. Which actually, that shows a lot of trust. But 1912 is uh, uh, when this would actually begin. This was a sign that was actually found in the, in the storeroom in Columbus, uh, uh, the Columbus, uh, Bartholomew County, which shows the interaction of Extension, Purdue University, and USDA way back in the very beginning. In case you're wondering who those four men were, you can see LaPorte, Montgomery, St. Joe, and Park County were actually the four first agents that were, that were hired. So what we did was we wanted to study what it was, not on campus, but in the field, what, what was taking place. And we were very lucky that Purdue Archives had all of the original annual reports and back then, Michael, they had real annual reports, very detailed and lots of pictures. And so these are photographs for, uh, that you're going to see for what the county agents wanted us to, to know about their work. And they were using photographs to, uh, uh, to, to make their points along with the words. And so this particular book was a bicentennial, uh, was bicentennial book. So I want to take you back to the days of 1912, 1914, when the, the official extension would start in the country. And as you can see, no roads. Everybody lived in isolated communities, no electricity. As I travel the state and do these talks at Soil and Water and Extension and for Farm Bureau, it's amazing. Uh, Mike, we get people didn't have electricity to the 1940s and early 1950s in this state. We think it's always been here, but it's not that many years ago. Uh, everything was manual labor, and what they got paid was 20 cents a, um, an hour for work. So this would be a typical family, and I don't know what you know, you're in rural America when the pig makes the family portrait, correct? So tell me what you see here. Tell me about these young girls, um, three of them. Tell me about their dress, ma'am. Or anybody, huh? Homemade clothes. All homemade clothes. And so back then, you can see it's pretty sparse. Um, and the best story I have on this one was a guy was telling me, this man was probably in his 80s, 90s already. And so Bruce, he said, when my dad had to go to town, mama would tell him, now, Jim, look at the pattern. And Jim would have to find that pattern in the feed sacks to match the clothes and he said it always bothered him because he knew he was going to screw up because back then when you rode to town that's a long way there's i mean there's no roads um, all on on horses life was pretty tough and extension would have rat killing campaigns and so we had what we called campaigns and so mike we we would direct out of purdue these are things that we're going to do collectively across the state. Um, unlike now, we pretty much are left to what do we think in the county we need. But back then, they were directed. Again, these, these are the first extension agents. These are the first. And look, the guy here on the right is kind of cool. If you're old enough to remember Wild Kingdom, he kind of looks like somebody on Wild Kingdom. He's all really happy. He's really proud. Um, Every rat would cost a farmer $2 a year. So the idea was, how do we kill these rats um, and not feed them? And again, all over the state, you, again, you can kind of see 
uh, what people did to, uh, uh, to control these rats. We've talked about the marshes and draining of the Indiana marshes. Well, this was the period that it was happening. Hindsight, oh man, it was really bad, according to some people. But if you lived on these, uh, these marshy areas and you had the farm, you had to drain the water. And so there, was no, there were no ditches. You did your own ditches. So it's kind of funny. After World War I, the government had all this leftover dynamite. And they said, what do we do with this dynamite? And they said, give it to the farmers. They can use it. So, Mike, we had extension agents did demonstrations where we blew up rock stumps and you can see on the top right, uh, and ditches. Can you imagine today going to Dean and say, Dean, I want to have a dynamite demonstration. We're only going to have 50 people there. Nothing too much to, to worry about. Now, put yourself in a position in the 1914s and 20. Everything is brand new. There's, it, this is all science. And all of the science, Bruce, was already done. It was out of the experiment station, but they had, could never get the word out. So when the extension folks came in, they gave voice to the research, kind of like what, what, we do, uh, what we do today. And you can always tell who the extension agent is based on his dress, suit and tie, no matter what they were doing, and hat. And so here, he is actually determining whether the soil is sweet or sour. So Walt, what does that mean to you? Whether it's acidic or basic. Acidic or basic. We use the term sweet and sour. Most of our soils uh, were too acidic. And we know today, if your soil is too acidic, it can't get certain nutrients. So our agents actually had these test kits, and we would go out and help people to figure out how much lime they needed. Lime allowed us to raise the pH and to uh, sweeten it. Now, all manual, the trains would come up. You can see the horse and the carts. I have not quite figured out yet how much each one of these holds, but let's just for the sake of argument, it's, it's two tons. So Walt, when you were a county agent, what would be an average amount of tons per acre? Do you remember that? Yeah, for line. Uh, four, six. Yeah, four and six in your county. Can you imagine if, if this held two tons, for every acre of ground, I would have to make two, three, and four trips? So it only worked if you were close by because the trains had to be unloaded or you paid a penalty for them just sitting there. So, but it was to help for those people that were close by. Um, and then the trucks came in, so you can kind of see the truck and the, uh, the horse and the buggy. Some people couldn't do it, so what they would do is actually extension would create these lime bins that the guys, when they came to town, could actually load up the lime and get it one load at a time. But if you live very far, you could not haul the lime, right? There was no roads. So what Extension did was actually created a lot of businesses. They would, these guys would buy these pulverizers and you would pulverize the lime that was on your farm and that is how you got the lime for yourself and or sold it to other, um, other people. This is how we applied it, which is not much different than today. Today we don't have ears sticking up front, but it's the same, the same process of making the application. And the result was, Don, that we were now able to grow clover and alfalfa when nobody could. Why was that such a benefit? Because it changed the soil pH. It changed the soil pH where alfalfa and clover can now grow. And what do we do with clover and alfalfa? What's it fed to? Oh, you're improving the nutrients for the li livestock. It's all livestock. So now we're able to have livestock that we can actually uh, promote, and it increased the value of the land tremendously when now we were able to, to grow these crops. Now, Bruce, it was a good story unless you lived a long way. And if you lived a long way, you couldn't get the lime, 
And so for many people, including me, I didn't realize that soybeans actually came in, Mike, for your dairy guys. Because soybeans could grow on more acid soil, and so therefore it actually was a hay crop. Soybeans was a hay crop to allow, uh, 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 Mike, your dairymen and, and women to be able to, to raise animals. One of my favorite shots, it is not OSHA approved, but if you'll take a look at it, look at how, they're, how are they powering, uh, because beans would eventually become a protein source. And if you kind of look at it, uh, let's see, the laser, let's see if it, they're running it off a jacked up car. So I thought that was, uh, that's a pretty good one. Now, ma'am, is seed corn, is seed corn living? Kernels on a cob, is that a living thing? But it's alive, on the, it's alive, right? It has to be. And it's surprising how many people don't know that. Uh, it has to be, or why would you plant it? Because nothing would come up. It is alive. But because the research, the research again, we'll keep coming back to this, the research had already been done. Roughly 30% of the corn that these, that these farmers were planting was dead before they even planted it. And if you think about it, I mean, you did this for how many decades at the seed lab with the state chemist? You looked at, you still look at germination, is that correct? Certainly do. Yes. And no different back in the, I mean, 100 years ago, because the corn was being stored outside, and the guys, gals would go to the cribs, pick up the corn, and if it looked good to the eye, that's what they used. And so this was called the ragdoll test, and for a farmer could bring them in for half a penny an ear or a cent an ear, and what you would do is take uh, six, seven kernels off, you would line them up, you know what the, that row is, you've got it numbered, and in fact, if you looked on the wood there, you can see numbers. And so what Extension would do at the courthouses, uh, they would actually germinate each one of them. And we do that today at Science Fair Project. The young kids will take corn, add water, watch the things germinate, and we would also look at diseases. And so then what they would do, Bruce, is take the corn that was good, which meant germinated no disease, throw them in the bag from planting, and the other ones that didn't do very well went to the pigs. And that right there improved tremendously the yields, got us up to around 40 bushels to the acre. All right, but things are looking better. And you can see here what the germ test, the extension uh, agent back then, we call them educators today, but the extension agent there is actually doing the reading on the test. Man in the back is actually uh, recording the data for him. So we asked then, Don, instead of looking at the ears in the bin for germination, which we would continue to do that, we asked the farmers to go out into the field and select their corn from the field. Any guesses why? Well, you could observe the healthy, higher quality uh, ears. You could see, that's right, you could look at the stalks. You could look for the presence of diseases. You could see that the ear wasn't 20 feet high because these were all hand-picked. It gave you an observation that you ob obviously lost track once you, you picked them out. And so this was a big move to improve it. Livestock was hu huge. When the agents came to being, uh, farmers were fighting hog cholera. And it was, it was decimating this particular industry. You could barely get them. And so we had some uh, uh, cures here at Purdue, some ideas how to fix it, and they would actually promote the vaccine sanitation. Um, and in fact, the educators were more like veterinarians um, and regulatory veterinarians at the time to try to prevent the spread. Folks, these were pigs. It ain't like today, these are hogs. And Bruce, any idea what it would be if you were back in the 1912s? We know very little. What might be some things that you think we could push 
here to help these hog producers? Probably health in general. Uh, health in general, yeah, right. yes. Whether it's diet or, or medicine. Uh, let's just do diet. So diet was important. Most of them fed straight corn. Corn has very is low level of protein, so now we started showing them how to use soybeans to move these hogs even quicker. Uh, we looked at genetics was coming into being. Uh, the average hog, I think, had six or eight young, and I don't know what it is today. Do you know, Walt? I want to say 12 or 14. Eight, eight to 12. Eight to 12. Uh, just from genetics, um, and we probably lost half of the young pigs before they got to market. So there was a lot of work here to do, and it was part of getting farmers to uh, understand sanitation. And this is what we seem to be wanting to go back to today, is having animals to be loose in the fields. Um, um, and this is, I mean, we've already done it. A pasture, have the animals on pasture. The problem was these pastures were full of roundworms. And so we would ask, uh, you can see the gentleman with the hat right over the, the pig. We would ask the farmers, bring in your runt pigs. And so farmers would bring in their runt pigs and we would do an autopsy right there in front of everybody. And when they opened up the young pigs, they were just full of worms. You could see these worms. That had a lot of impact to get people to spend the money to, to do the, the, the worming. So you're right, medical, feed, Bruce, and those kind of things. And this is, you administer the, basically trying to administer the worm capsule. Um, it was pretty interesting. After World War I, we actually had the hogs do a lot of our harvesting. And this was not like just a few acres. These were tens of thousands of acres. We didn't have labor. So what you did was you let the hogs self-feed uh, into corn and soybean mix, um, and then they return fertilizer for you in the form of manure. This is a photograph here that the Amish, when I work with the Amish, they just go ballistic. This is their world today. Um, and if you looked at them, after World War I, all the labor is in town. So Don, Agriculture after 1919 is in a depression for a decade before the big depression. We couldn't get labor, we couldn't pay it, so what we're learning to do here is to team the horses so that we could pull bigger pieces of equipment and get rid of labor that we didn't have. These were not just a handful of people showing up, these were major events. And so Extension would show how to team these horses properly. Ma'am, if you, if you were a farmer, and you might be, if you were a farmer, after World War I, chickens, poultry, and dairy saved most of our farms. We're in a huge depression. Everybody else is making money, but they want to buy eggs and milk. Would you want to feed chickens who didn't lay eggs? No. We do that in town today. We have chickens in town. They have names. These are nameless chickens. Uh, how would you know she's laying? This is great because I meet some of these old folks out there, some of the people in their 80s, 90s, and even older, and they know the answer to that. How do you know if a hen's laying? You, you can tell by feeling the back end. Feeling the back end will be more specific. It's They'll always hold up three fingers. If the vent is three fingers, she's laying. If the vent is one finger, she's not. And if it's two, it, it could go either way. And so what Extension did, and every poultry, every farm had about 100 hens, it was how to feed them, how to house them, but to begin with, how to check, um, how to check whether or not they, they were laying. These were kids. Uh, it was so easy, the kids could learn how to do it, it was said. And what was interesting, Mike, is that farmers never want to change. They never want to change. And the reason is it's such a risky business. If I know, if I can get to this point, why change? Because change is risk. 
So the farmer says, you're telling me that all these good-looking hens that you've got as non-layers are not laying eggs. I don't believe it. So what they did was they took the hens, put them in a pen. They want the ones that were laying, they put them in a the pen, fed them the same thing, and guess what they showed them? Same, I could, I could actually determine which hen was not laying. This is the importance of research, Bruce. Sometimes in today's world, we kind of, eh, whatever. But back then, this was research that had already been done. We had a poultry department, and these folks had already figured this out. Now we were getting, uh, getting the word out. We began to help farmers to basically run their farms as a business. And back in the days, these were farm budgets. Uh, Don, did you, in the earlier days of your work here, this is Don Kelso we're speaking with. Don, did you have much to do in budgets and farm books and record books? Were you part of that? Or was that the generation prior? No, that was the generation prior. Yeah. So the farmers would actually let us look at their books, Purdue and analyze them. They would determine what the losses, what the gains were, where they were losing out. And what they would do is actually get maybe the better farmers and look at their books and share that information with the rest of, rest of the farmers. We would do the field days with the records. We would hang the data on the barns where every farmer then could actually take a look at the data. So Mike, this is your world. This would have been a typical dairy. Uh, you know, you, you never like to compare today to then because that was the standard back then, but you notice how the cans are just Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, the typical dairy was probably six or eight milking cows, um, but this guy had concrete. I mean, this was pretty modern, uh, pretty modern for the times. And it's also ironic, what were they trying to, what, what was important when it came to cows? How did I make money from the dairy? Sell the cream. And, yeah, sell the cream was, was the big, was the big amount, right? And you t once you took the cream, what do you have left? Skim milk. skim milk. Today, we drank skim milk and pay more money for skim milk than we do whole milk. Back in those days, the skim milk went to the pigs. Nobody drank skim milk. Uh, but So this is how we were able to utilize everything on the farm. This was fascinating. Purdue would say, if, if Walt, you get me 26 dairymen, and each one of those dairymen have got to put up X number of dollars. And if they do that, and you have to write the checks in advance, if you do that, then Purdue would hire a milk tester. And that milk tester is, one, is the gentleman right here, and he would go from farm to farm every day. Uh, he would go to a different farm, and he would measure milk. Uh, Mike, that would be volume percent weight, uh, that's right, this is weight, and percent uh, butter fat. Butter fat. That's about it. Yeah. Yes, he could estimate, he could estimate um, how much feed the animal was eating while he was there, and obviously, how much money did I make off the butter fat, how much did it cost a feeder, um, and then you could do a calculation. And if the animal, Don, didn't do very well, you sold it to some other dairy. No, you, that was how we were able to improve. And what was nice about this person, though he wasn't extension directly, he was kind of responsible to extension. He was able to, like we do today, I learned from you, Walt, I learned from you. And as he made his rounds, he got to see what good things that people were doing. Uh, he promoted the feed and all of the other things to make it better. This is in Madison County in the early days. Demonstrations that we seem to be coming back to today, demonstrates, demonstrations were the normal. So this particular county agent, um, if you notice that almost back then, the townships were extremely important. Everything was about townships. Unlike I think today, it seems to have less importance. And what you're seeing here is, is the number one is oat smut. 
you can see going down the list the demonstrations that he had. Um, and if you notice number one, he had 21 demonstrations put out into the field. If you looked at number two, this wheat demonstration, variety test, you can see he had 137 of these demonstrations. And what Extension would do, Walt, is they would put the demonstration on, they would get you to help me as the farmer, and then on the day, whatever they were trying to prove, we would invite all of the neighbors around it to come see that. Again, demonstrations, and you can see from fertilizer on corn, wheat, hog feeding, hog cholera. Uh, gentlemen here had a rather busy schedule keeping track of all this stuff. These are agents that uh, showed up, uh, uh, county agents that were hired. Uh, we would, Purdue would use the specialists to train them. Uh, Purdue would uh, teach each one of these men. They were all men um, at this particular time. Purdue was big about going to the counties, and you've heard bringing the university to the people. Can you imagine today bringing a bunch of cows into a gymnasium, sitting them around, ain't going to happen, isn't that right, Walt? No room for basketball. No room, that's correct. But they would bring out good cows, bad cows, good pigs, bad pigs, uh, 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 the dairy was the, the same thing. They would have trains that would come out. F many generations were trained off, trained off these trains. And you would come to these trains. Uh, here is one, you're looking at uh, uh, dairy. Uh, you, sometimes it was sires, the genetics. Uh, and then you could actually go inside of a train and listen to a speaker. And they would go from stop to stop to stop, uh, giving out the information. And, and Bruce, for many people, these, for many people, these kinds of stops well, let's just go forward. Where is oh head escape? Let's try it the other way. Yeah, he he can make this cut. These were actually probably the first times that people even knew anything about Purdue uh, uh, because this was the first interaction with people from Purdue and, and, from, and from the science. Now, the other part of the farm that we did not talk about are the ladies. The ladies who lived on the farm took care of everything in the home, plus more obviously. Uh, oftentimes the business uh, had the business head but here, the way it worked was, because we had no women agents at the time, Purdue uh, would actually send out from the experiment station women who were trained in uh, how to make clothing, nutrition, all the things that we do, taking care of children, taking care of the sick. And the way it worked was these home ec clubs, which there were thousands of them, would send two people, Don, to a almost like a train the trainer program you would send the uh, two would come the ladies from Purdue would teach them in this case how to make hats um, and then those two trainers would go back to their group and repeat the exercise you can always tell extension we have to label everything so we've got layers here does anybody know what we're teaching here This is a cellar. Yeah, it's, a cellar. it's just a, basically a, a fancy root cellar. Um, and we're teaching because there's no electricity. And you're trying to teach people how to preserve um, some of their foods. And this was one way. I, to me, it's one of the prettiest pictures I got. I love the hats. Uh, these are the typical kinds of hats, just beautiful hats for, for the time. But you can see uh, working at a home on how to store food how to take care of kids, how to take care of the elderly. Tuberculosis was a, bit, was a big to do during this time period. Uh, there's no roads, there's very few doctors, it's very few cars. And so uh, it was left to the women of the home to be able to take care of their sick. I had a chance to meet a lady and, and I wished I could have got her name and uh, she since I was told has, has passed. 
Back in the days, most of the kids coming out of rural, Amer rural Indiana was coming to school hungry. And it made the home ec ladies extremely mad that we, allow, that we would allow it. So it started off pretty simple that the, uh, it was during the winter time, these kids would bring their jars, they would heat up the water, and Don, it could be as simple as hot cocoa or soup that these kids would have something warm for, for their lunch. The home economics clubs got together and as told by this one particular person, and the ladies actually did the cooking for the schools. So these were volunteers who would cook. Kids could bring in supplies that they could cook and get credit. And if you didn't, you could see what it cost you to, to have your meal. And Bruce, I don't know about you, five cents for a cup of coffee. Kids drink, huh? Hot dogs and chili. That's, I'm thinking, that's not bad. Um, Coffee, they actually drank more coffee than they did milk in many of these places. And so part of the education, obviously, was to get people to drink more milk. As we got into the schools, just like we do today, what you have is the county agent who is teaching kids about corn. Why would we want to teach the kids? Why would Extension want to get into the schools? Because, you're right, because you know all of these are going to be the next generation farmers. Everybody went back. The truth is, and that is true, the truth is extension agents back in that day, their boss was the, was the superintendent of schools, not Purdue. It wasn't, I think, until the 1940s, I don't have a specific date, that Purdue would take full control of them. But back in this time, you were actually, Purdue would send you the name, kind of like we do today, Walt, uh, Purdue sends the county the names of prospective hires. Uh, the county board, uh, the, the county uh, extension board takes a look at it, and then you actually do the hiring. Well, back then, it was the superintendent, and they expected you to work in, into the schools. You would teach the boys how to go out and do the same things you told their dads. And our idea was, ma'am, uh, the idea was if you teach the kids, might they tell the parents? In fact, they do. They would tell their parents, and the parents got tired of that because the kids would try to tell them about how things should be done. Out of this education came the 4-H program uh, for youth. Uh, a typical group of young ladies uh, going to go to one of their club meetings, and a supervisor, as we have today, teaching these boys whatever his lesson of the day is on, on pigs. These kids were all expected to complete their project. These are three brothers who are working with hogs, learning how to raise hogs. Girls too could compete in any of the livestock and they did, they did very well. While society says women could only do a few things, at least in the 4-H programs with the young ladies, they could compete in anything that they wanted to compete. Now that is one happy hog, isn't it, Don? Looks quite happy. He looks quite happy getting kind of washed down, getting ready for the fair. Uh, the girls would compete in sewing, cooking, and here you've got an old-timey stove, um, and this young lady is, is making bread. The boys would have the one-acre corn club. And by the way, these boys could raise a hundred, the standard was a hundred bushels to the acre. These boys could do it because they followed what Extension told them, whereas their daddies would not. They had to keep records on cost. And so what it showed them was that, that you could actually do better, dad. And, and when these boys got to be older, then again, they would remember these, these, these lessons learned. Any idea who this person is? Looks like Orville. Huh? Is it Orville? Nope. Actually, Orville's not a bad guess. Some people say it looks like uh, Alfalfa. <laughs> if you're that far back on Spanky in our game. Actually, the, uh, this is Mr. Stewart of Stewart Seeds. Uh, that, that is Mr. Stewart. The, the older, the younger brother just recently passed away 
within the last year. But what we did in 4-H is still important today. What can we teach these young boys and girls that will benefit them in life and in careers? In this case, he would become a very successful uh, person. And so long and short, the kids still had camps back in this day. And here we're showing them how to kill chickens, pluck them, skin them, and cook them. Michael, I don't, we can't. Yeah, that's, that's right. Today, that just, you know, happens all the time, doesn't it? Uh, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea, but uh, anyhow. And then the young boys would learn skills that were important to them, making rope halters, doing things that they would have some, some practical aspects to their, their home. And so the bottom line of, of all of this, and we'll have a specific question, our goal back in the early days was obviously to teach the adult. The adult, Bruce, who had learned from his parents, from his grandparents. And what we learn is you only learn so much and then we stop because we feel very comfortable. There's no more risk to take. And then we would teach the young kids the same thing and hopefully because they have, don't have those barriers. And then hopefully we could raise their standard as they got to be older and maybe influence uh, uh, the grandpa as well. So who cares? I mean, ultimately, who cares? It's a great story, got a book out of it, beautiful photographs, but who cares? What's the point? Bruce, any, from, from those that's in this audience here, what, what does that have to do with anything that's gonna be happening tomorrow? Huh? It's the same situation today. There's new tools, new genetics, new ways to do things all the time, and, and it's not necessarily you know, the existing producers who are um, adopting those new, new technologies. A lot of times it's the young people. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, hit the button. Do, do that again. He's saying, I can't do that again. You're just, yeah, you, you're, you're a good extensive person. You'll make up another set. So, so, so go ahead, Bruce. So, so who cares? You saw a lot of nice pictures. You, you saw some neat things. Uh, we're way beyond those days today. Uh, this was new science back then. What was that guy do with today? Well, it's essentially the same situation today as it was back then. There are still new tools being developed, new genetics, new ways to do things, uh, you know, precision agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the older farmers aren't necessarily adopting those new technologies. It's the new farmers. That's so, correct we're still in the same situation of keeping farmers up to date and doing better. Um, anybody else? Anybody else? I think, I think the other thing that's really interesting is a, a lot of what we used to do in the past is coming back. There, is, there are markets for pasture-raised animals. Yes. And so even figuring out what were some of the tools that were used to prevent roundworm or you know, things like this, what, what can we learn from the past that we kind of have lost as we've moved into a different type of agriculture and now are kind of re returning to that. We, we have people in the, the various disciplines here that go back to these old report and the old circulars and the old research to see what worked for them because nothing's changed. We are just, our technology is wanting to go back a little bit. That's not right. Our tech, people, our consumers are demanding certain things and we're going to try to provide them for those that want them. That's right. What else? What about the, go ahead, Don. Uh, hold your, push your button down. You're setting a pattern for the appreciation for agriculture and setting a, an educational atmosphere for the younger generation to observe what their grandparents went through. Okay. Mike? Yeah, we still have students coming to school hungry every morning. Uh, there was one county, and I hope I get the numbers right, it's, I, did, I do leadership classes. One county, one county, and it's not counties that you would suspect, it's a very rural county in Indiana, 65% of the kids come to school hungry. I said, that's not right. And, they said, and this was a leadership class, these people had been studying it, 65%, they still come, they come hungry. What about culture? What about the culture? What is, I guess, the bottom line of all this, these are neat pictures, neat all that, but what's the, what is it about the culture? What does extension, 
mean? Because these men, later on women, would set this up. It could be the farm, the home, the children, the community. All the big buzzwords, Walt, that we have today, right? Agonatural Resources, HHS, uh, 4-H, and Community Development, which we now call... Community Development. Okay, it's Community Development. I did switch over. Those are the buzzwords. Those are the big programmatic areas. What's the culture of extension? Back then, it was the trusted source of research. That's the one thing that, no question, those farmers all believed in and, and could see um, from the examples and from the demonstrations that this, this worked and it moved things forward. That's correct. I don't, I don't know if that's the same case today where you can Google anything and look at a YouTube video from anybody and all of a sudden that becomes truth. Um, the truth is in the eye of the beholders and obviously I can Google anything but there's nothing like being in front of a man or woman saying, this is what I think, Bruce. You know it as somebody who works with grapes, your small fruit. There's nothing like you being there saying, this is what the research says. I know what you're reading, but that ain't right. That's the trusted source. It's a culture of caring, ma'am. We care about the people. Um, it's specifically at the county level where we have county educators, Walt, it's knowing the community, having a respect for what men and women do, and trying to offer what assistance we can. That's what we've been doing for 100 years. And it makes it very, very difficult when administrators and county educators and specialists don't appreciate the past because we're here today because of the past of caring. And Bruce, I hope it's still true of using proven science to answer to the best of our abilities people's questions, not made up stuff. Would anybody else add anything? Walt, is anything that you would want to add to this one? Because he can cut and paste and anything else you would add as we start to finish up? Yeah, just, just one thing. I'd like your comments on this, but I think at one time in the history of extension, the extension educator along with probably the doctor, the clergyman, and maybe some of the, the school teachers were the, by far the most educated people in um, rural communities. And now um, that's no longer the case. So it's changed um, the way that our educators have to build relationships within the community. Would you comment on that? That's correct. So back then to get these jobs required a bachelor's degree, that was a high degree because most of the people in, in communities did not have it. They were the source of information because they were backed by the Purdue Research and trained by the Purdue researchers. So that, that worked very well. So obviously today there's lots of people that have influence. But I still argue whether I'm a specialist or a county educator that I can overcome that because it's still trust. And when people know you care about them, you've got a leg up on almost everybody else. But, but Mike, you can't do that on a computer. You have to get out and meet people. You have to go where they meet. You have to see what their needs are. If you're working with diabetes, which, you know, that, that, that part of we do today, you should ha be at a diabetes clinic. You, you should see what suffering people go through so that you have knowledge. And so I guess for me to gain that trust, to be able to show that I know what I'm talking about, I got to get out of the office and go see things so that I can learn. Because you can't learn extension out of a book or off a computer. You have to go out and, and visit and learn. Yes, ma'am. I just want to ask one more thing or kind of make a comment. But one of the things that I think you also showed was the fact that extension educators were using successful farmers both in enterprise budgets or different models and as we move into the future and we have diversified agriculture it's not going to be just corn and beans in Indiana we have fewer research funds coming into from the federal government and the state government we have to seek out these successful farmers that are planting small grains that are doing organics that are doing you know pasture raised pork these kind of things and it's fascinating to see that they were doing it back then. Sure. So comments on that. Sure, because the best way to convince any grower, big or small, inorganic or not, 
is to have people like them doing the work testifying on your behalf. It's testimonial, still work very, very well. Um, so today, as an example, just to play off of what you said, we have the small, the, the small farms, people doing small farms. And that to me is a good example. We have still the, the corn and beans and the dairy and the hogs, still extremely important. But we have people asking us about uh, 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 Bruce uh, wanting to put in vineyards, uh, wanting to put in uh, hops for beer, uh, doing organic. So our small farms would still work the same way. If you had a small farm and you had a good hops production, I would use you to teach all the other people. So that doesn't change. And you're absolutely correct. Who can give us testimony that what we're doing is in fact what they've seen on their own farm or their own, or home or 4-H? Yes, ma'am, that's very true. Thank you, Fred. Let's give Fred a, a hand here for us. Well, thank you much, Walt. Yeah. I think we can all learn a lot about what you shared today about what uh, the foundation of extension was all about and how we can take those principles that are were true then and still true today and apply them to be successful. Uh, I would like to uh, remind everybody that this uh, session is being recorded and will be available through a link by way of email in a few days. And that uh, one week from today, February 13th at the same time, we're going to have two more speakers. Uh, we're going to have Jennifer Boyle Warner, who's the director of the Indiana Association of Soil Water, talk about uh, the association uh, and uh, how they partner with Purdue. And then we're also going to talk about with uh, doc hear from doc from Mr. Ed Shelton. Ed is the director of the Indiana Green Buyers and Warehouse Licensing Agency, and he's going to share with us. Uh, the, the responsibility that he has and how it applies to agriculture here in Indiana. So thank you very much. <laughs>